I'm sure a lot of different organizations in the U.S. were taking notice, especially, like, oh, well, he won the title over there. Look how you know, important of a figure he is over there. So there was rumors circulating around that WWE and TNA were definitely interested in you. Was there ever any thought of you going back, or was it one of those things where K1 wasn't going to allow it and you were making just too much money in Japan to even consider it? Yeah, you know, at that time, I'm just, I'm just making way too much uh, money in Japan. And when they came, they came back at me twice, and and uh, the first time I was making way too much money, and two, I was too much uh, under contract with K1. And then when my contract ended, they offered me a contract again. That was TNA and WWE at the time. But unfortunately, um, I signed with that group. It was called Hustle out of Japan. So. That was uh, was under contract then, and now you know I'm just loving loving it far too much right now. I'm just bouncing around the world and enjoying you know and enjoying my life. So it kind of uh, came and, and went, and, and uh, I'm I'm kind of still uh, buzzing around. <laughs> yeah, you're always keeping busy. You're always doing stuff, and I feel like in Japan, especially with a guy like you, they'll they'll pay you right, and you know you'll have some fun, kind of just traveling the world, so to speak, but. With Hustle and with Japan, and even in other organizations, they always kind of put you with the top guy. You're always viewed very well. I think that's important, too. Sometimes when you come to WWE, they try to humble you or they try to do something stupid with you. Um, you know, like with Goldberg, when he first came over, they try to put him in a wig, in a, in a you know, yellow gold dust wig. And just, I don't know, they, they always do kind of, kind of like corny stuff. I know you are you you can handle stuff like that. You're, you know, you you do a lot of sitting in the longest yard. You, you, you had a lot of fun stuff. You showed your charisma, showed your versatility. But I feel like in Japan, they, they take you very seriously, and they always put you with the top guys. Like in, in Hustle, you'll be in there, obviously, Takata. You'll be in there, Takata's on a huge, huge megastar in Japan. Then they'll put you with Kawada and Tenru and stuff like that. Was that important to you to kind of not only be a top taken very seriously and, and be given kind of that main event status? You know, I, I really I, I, I appreciate and, and I and I really love the fact that uh, you know when I I'm, I'm going around the world or I'm in Japan I am on uh, many 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 times the, the main event and um, not all the time but the, but the majority of the time I am on the main event and I, I I really appreciate that so I work with anybody I go through and as long as we're there to have a wonderful time and, and enjoy it and just and everybody's having fun I, I have I love getting in there with those legendary pro wrestlers or uh, legendary fighters, you know. And, you know, I love getting getting beat down by by the by the fighters of, of tomorrow, you know. So I love getting beat down today by the fighters of tomorrow. So it, it, it's great. All Japan Pro Wrestling and even Wrestle 1, Gray Muda kind of brings you into each one when he was in charge of All Japan. He wanted you there. What are your kind of feelings on a guy like Muda, who's just a huge, huge legend in Japan and obviously very popular in the, in the States as well? Yes. Uh, you know, Muda and I, we go back all the way to the WCW days. So when Muda was at WCW, I met him and I said, hey, Muda, you're, I, I, I love your stuff, man. You're great. And I always see him and Muda looked at me and he said, who are you? And he just kept walking. I said, oh. Hmm. I said, Muda, Look what you did to me back in the day, and we just we start cracking up all on. He's like, I remember you. I remember you. It's just young boy, man. Wow, yeah, you too stiff, man. Too stiff. Oh. So we really have a great time. <laughs> I love in the pro wrestling world when they do things where they kind of bring real life into it. So in all Japan, when you fought Ernesto Hoost in in the wrestling match. But that was a pretty cool kind of like throwback, like, oh, let's let uh, Ernesto Hoos kind of get, get his win back, or so to speak. It, <laughs> it was kind of kind of an interesting way to, to book that. What were your, your thoughts on that? Because that's kind of uh, an interesting uh, pairing, especially considering he doesn't have pro wrestling experience. That's right. So what that was, again, uh, uh, you know, it takes a while for you to really understand what the Japanese are saying and how things are working. So let's take a look at this. This was called... Uh, I just beat uh, Ernest Lewis two times, and then you saw me. I would come, come into that match on the high atop the Tokyo Dome as a nice little floating angel. <laughs> and that floating angel was a wish from the gods that I could beat Bob Sapp. So then I would come down there, and Ernest Lewis would beat me in the pro wrestling match, <laughs> which came true. <laughs> 
very kind of cool stuff. I, I just love pro wrestling in that aspect where they, they do stuff like that. So much fun. When you're wrestling in the Tokyo Dome, obviously, you know, whether fighting or wrestling there, you, you've made some appearances. One of the meccas in the world, obviously here in the United States, it's probably MSG. Thing. You know, it's places like that where people hold in high regard. In Japan, it's it's the Tokyo Dome. I mean, there are some other great arenas like the Saitama Super Arena, stuff like that. But what are your thoughts on the Tokyo Dome in specific, you know, specifically wrestling in the Tokyo Dome or even fighting in Tokyo Dome? I've fought in Tokyo Dome. I wrestled in Tokyo Dome, and it is amazing because I have fought and wrestled in front of over 100,000 people. And those people over there, that's when it gets really pumped and you can feel the energy coming through. Now, fighting, now, I've done that as well, but I've done that in college football and I've done that in pros where I've, where I've played in front of over 100,000 people and I played in the Orange Dome and the Rose Bowl and where the Green Packers played and then around the world. So I've traveled the U.S. and fought in the best arenas, played in the best arenas. Now, in Japan, it's a different feel. When I, when I fought Nogera and they had people jumping out of airplanes or helicopters, I'm sorry, to get their seats, that's what I'm talking about, how amazing that place is. Very special. And for people that don't know, is that a huge culture shock going from the United States and basically, like you said before, learning the language and living there? Is that just a gigantic culture shock, for, especially for somebody from the States to just kind of go and do it and just – basically live in Japan and become this big star over there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it can definitely uh, get you get you where you, you, you'll, you'll get in a taxi, okay, and the taxi only speaks Japanese and everything around you is Japanese. So if you leave your, your place, at that time when I leave my hotel, you know, just for me to cross the street, it'd take me almost two to three hours. That's how many fans and everything would be packing around me. So I would have to go to McDonald's, take three hours, and then see if I could get the McDonald's and bring it back to the room within another three hours. So you're looking at almost six hours just to get something to eat, like a McDonald's. So it was incredible. No, Japan is majorly populated. It was incredible, and it still is to this day. So, you know, I mean, it's always going to be my home, and that's why it's all, you're always going to see some kind of uh, cultural class or lost in translation stuff that goes on with me in Japan, and if you are unable to really follow it or follow what I'm doing around the world, you know, you can kind of get lost in that, you know. Um, many people kind of look at my fight record and say, well, hey, look, he's losing fights, and, you know, he's no significant to MMA. Well, hang on, guys. Let's, let's settle down. He's got the world record, okay? Settle down. You know, I'm no longer even in the United States <laughs> for making <laughs> some money. So they kind of get a a little bit lost with, with what, I, what I'm doing and how I should be doing things and telling you how to run the, the, the Bob the Beast business. <laughs> well, you can tell me, but, you know, advice only works if you listen. <laughs> with that, as far as Japan and you saying, you know, go the taxi and stuff, you are, you know, a ginormous guy, huge personality, but as far as just kind of walking the streets and being in Japan, is it a shock for those people to see you? Because I'm sure there's not a lot of monsters uh, roaming around, you know, real life. You know, Godzilla's roaming around in Japan. Are they shocked to see you? So, so they're they're they're, they're now used to when they when they see me. Oh, hey, Bob Steps, because I've been there for so many years. But you know, um, the, the fascination is is with um, Bob the Beast staff going around. You know. Um, as, but they, they, they have in Japan. They, they have big guys. They've got sumo. They've got big wrestlers and all of that stuff. So really, it, it turns down to see you know. So they, they have seen and, and have their big their big icons over there. It's just you know the the beast. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's when uh, I get a little unique. 